Welcome. We have been studying the book of Mark this quarter, and today we are studying lesson number four, which is entitled Parables. Let us all bow our heads for a word in prayer. Our Creator God, our Heavenly Father, we once again come before Thee. As we seek Thy mercies upon us, Father, we thank Thee for all the good things that have done for us in our life. And as we delve upon another study, which is going to open our eyes of what Thy kingdom is, we pray that Thou would be very close to us. May the Holy Spirit speak to us so that we would be able to open our minds and hearts and be receptive of Thy word. Help this study to transform our lives. Help us to draw closer to Thee. For I ask these few words in Thy holy and righteous dear name. Amen. We have been studying about the controversies that Jesus, while He was on this earth, had to undergo. And today's lesson is entitled Parables. And we know that it was something that Jesus used quite frequently. The concept of parables that Jesus used were not something that were new. And we understand that the word parable by itself means to set alongside. So it was a story that was, or an illustration that was told in accordance to a greater truth that Jesus wanted to tell the people who were listening to it. And as Jesus used parables, the idea was to set a spiritual truth alongside a daily truth of living. Now, these parables were not just any story or illustration that is told because the people would not be able to understand the greater truths in the Bible. But these parables had a particular purpose. They were pointing out to a spiritual truth. And as we delve upon the study, we look forward to what is being taught in these parables. We would understand that why these parables at times uh, end up amongst the biblical scholars as something that is objectionable, something that they end up not having a common consensus on. Because as the lesson points out that for many years, scholars have argued over the meanings and interpretations of Jesus' parables. How to interpret what they mean, why Jesus used them, what kind of lessons they were intended to reveal, and how literally they were to be taken are things that many have had to ponder upon over time. But instead of really coming to one particular conclusion, we need to look at the great, greater truth that a parable is bringing to us. And so, as the memory text points out in Mark chapter 4, verse 24, verse 25, says, Then he said to them, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has, will be taken away from him. And that is why the understanding of the parables was very crucial. Because Jesus did not narrate that as a story. It had a greater truth hidden in it. And for those people who did not want to know anything about that truth, who did not have anything to do with that truth, as the verse points out, that even what they actually had to start off with would be taken away from them. And so there are five parables that are discussed in lesson number four. The parable of the sower, parable of the lamb, the measures, the growing seed, and the mustard seed. And the greatest importance in our lesson is upon the parable of the sower. Let's look at each of these parables one by one. Now, the parable of the sower is something that we already know, and it's not something that we need to really remind ourselves of, except for the truths that are hidden in them. And while Jesus was teaching this parable, he was again on a boat with the people standing on the shore. And it's a place that Jesus has used before to teach his lessons, as we have seen in the previous chapter as well. And Jesus talks about a sower who went to sow. And we know that while he threw the seeds, some fell on the path, on the roadside between stones, some fell among thorns, and the others fell on good land. It says, and it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, 
and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched because it had no root. Some fell among the thorns, and the thorns choked them, and they yielded no fruit. But the ones that fell on the good ground, they yielded fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty and some sixty and some hundreds. So we know that there are seeds on that fell on the road that were eaten immediately by the birds. The fowls of the air came and took those immediately. So there was an instant response to what happened to those seeds that fell by the roadside. There were seeds that fell on the rocky ground that initially sprang up and they had a very quick outcome. But then they were scorched by the sun. They had no soil to hold them because the roots did not have a place to, they had no depth basically. The seeds that fell on the weary soil had a longer life because it took longer to reach an unproductive end, but eventually they were choked down by the thorns. And the seeds that fell on the good soil were the ones that actually took the longest, presumably an entire growing season, as it was in the normal pattern of crop. And when you read this superficially, you would think, you know, what is Christ trying to tell the people? What is the seed? What is the soil? And we see that the seed was same in all these instances. It was the reaction of the soil that was different. And there are many parables that, you know, are just left this way. Jesus does not give a clear interpretation of the parable by itself because after we read in verse 9, he says, and he said unto them, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. And you would wonder, how is that an actual description of what the parable is or a definition of what the parable is? You would not know. And so we see that the spiritual meaning of the parable was not immediately apparent. And the disciples had to ask him about the parable. As we read in the subsequent verses from verses 10 to 12. But when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parable. So Jesus ended up giving the literal or an explanation of the parable Differently, He was not with the crowd at that time. He gave the parable to the crowd. He ended it by saying that those who have hear should hear it. But his disciples were confused. And so when he was with them separately, they asked him about the parable. And he said to them, to you, it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables. So that seeing they may see and not perceive. And hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. Now, if we superficially read this, and this is a portion that is from uh, Tuesday's portion where it talks about, uh, you know, the reason for these parables. And we are jumping into that much earlier. But it's important to understand because when we superficially read this, we might have this confusion that, is Jesus trying to say that the interpretation of the parable is only meant for a few chosen people? Was it only meant for the disciples? Clearly not, because we see a similar incident happening in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 to 13, where Isaiah also has great vision of God in the temple. And he's so overwhelmed by God's glory that he ends up seeing his uncleanliness and he uh, cannot face that situation. But as the verses go on, it says God cleanses him and commissions him with a shocking message. And the verses there echo the thoughts that are found in the book of Mark. The same verses that we read, we read in the book of Isaiah chapter 6, verses 8. And I hear the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, this is the message that God is giving to Isaiah Go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the hearts of these people fat and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. So you would think that, is God trying to say that, do not allow them to understand what is being said here? Not at all, because Christ himself, as pointed out in the previous lesson also, 
was trying very hard to make the people understand what was his actual mission on this earth. And so Jesus is saying that those who can hear should hear. Parables were like, you know, an open doorway, but people were standing outside the doorway. If they choose to enter, they would understand the meaning of that parable. But if they stood outside saying, yeah, I think I get what he's trying to say, or there's something that I'm not being able to connect with, and it's not something that I really want to know, and they keep standing outside at the doorway, they're never going to understand the meaning of the parable. And that is what Jesus is trying to tell you, that if I've told them a parable, now it's up to them whether they actually want to understand the mystery behind the parable. Because the mystery that the parable depicts is the kingdom of God. And if they want to understand anything about the kingdom of God, they would be curious. They would come back and say, Master, help me understand what is it that you wanted to expound by this parable? Because if you think about it, you know, there might have been different people in that crowd and each of them would have had a different interpretation of what the parable of the sower was. If there was a farmer standing there, he would think that, okay, Jesus is trying to tell me that, you know, you need to be more careful with your seeds. You should not throw them on the roadside or else the birds would come and take it away. You should not throw them in the thorns where they're going to choke them down. You should not throw them on the rocks where they might grow initially, but will be scorched by the sun. So the farmer might think that this is a lesson for me on how to grow the seeds more efficiently. If there was a politician standing there, he would think, oh, this is a good way to start, you know, a new scheme on fertilizers and how to help the farmer develop his crop better. So what Jesus is trying to say is how to bring up good crop, good harvest. And so he might consider that as an opportunity to maybe bring about schemes that would help the farmer develop his crop through fertilizers. If there was a news reporter, he might think that there's a good opportunity to, you know, bring up the news of how birds are taking away the seeds, as it points out, the ones that were on the roadside were taken up by the birds and fowls of the air. So the newspaper might run a story on how the birds have been devouring the seeds and not allowing it to grow in the soil, which would bring up good crop. They would take that as that interpretation. If there was a salesman, eventually he would end up selling the fertilizers thinking the farmer needs more help because all the seeds that he is sowing are not reaping good reward. And so there might be different interpretations of people when they look at this parable. But Christ had to expound upon that and explain to them what the actual meaning of the parable was. And if we read in the subsequent verses, from verses 13 to 20. This is when the disciples had asked Jesus what parable actually meant. And Jesus goes on to explain that the seeds were actually his word. We have read that also in different parts of the Bible, also in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 21. It says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted work which is able to save your soul. So the seeds in the parable were the word of God. And the soil represents different responses that we have to the word of God. Christ goes on to tell in the book of Mark chapter 4 verses 13, it says, The sower soweth the word. The sower soweth the word. The seed is the word. And then there are some that fall by the wayside or the path soil. And we see that the word is sown, but they have heard. But Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. So Jesus links the seeds that had fallen on the roadside to Satan taking over the truth. And it immediately goes away. Because they have no grounds in it, it is immediately taken away by Satan. The second, the ones that are sown on stony ground because they have no root. They have heard the word. They immediately receive it with gladness. So there is an initial rising of the crop, as it is mentioned in the parable. They initially receive the word with gladness, but because they have no root in themselves, they would endure it for a time. But afterwards, when afflictions and persecutions come, they are offended and they leave the word aside. So Jesus links the rocky soil to people with shallow commitments who have not counted the cost of discipleship. And as it says here, that they seem to have been baptized in boiling water. And unless the temperature around, around them is kept up to that point, they wither away. 
the religion that is born of merry excitement will die when the excitement is over. So initially there is an excitement, you know, I've joined this new religion, I have learned about the truth, it has changed me, it has transformed me, but if the roots are not deep enough, if we actually not count on the cost of discipleship, if we have actually not realized that there will be times of affliction, times of persecution, because Satan is going to come for the people who have chosen to be with God. And if we are not ready for that, we would just fall away like the seeds which fell on the rocky soil, which can be easily taken away. The weedy soil, the soil that have thorns in them, they hear the word and care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So these people, the people who are represented by the ones who are the weedy soil, the ones which have thorns, they expect and accept the word, but it gets choked because Jesus describes these people as those who stand for the cares of life and riches. And those people will end up falling for it. So it's, these are not people who, because of the sadness, the afflictions, move away from God. These are people who are going looking for better things. They are looking for gladness because they feel things in the world are going to make them happy. And those things end up choking out the world. But the good soil, the good soil stands for those who hear the word and receive it so that it grows and produces an abundant crop. And as the verse points out, many fold, the seed that falls on good ground produces 30, 60, and 100 fold. That is the significance of the seeds falling on good soil. For people who just hear the word of God and receive it and allow it to grow in their hearts. They are not driven by just a merry moment of gladness. They are not driven by running behind things that the world has to offer. They are people whose roots are grounded in good soil, who are willing to allow the word to grow in their hearts. And that is what Jesus' interpretation of the parable of the sower is. Let us not be, if we look at these stories, there are three stories of failure. The seeds that fell on the roadside, the seeds that fell on rocky ground, and the seeds that fell among the sun. Three stories of failure. The only story of success is the story that has taken the longest. Because the seed that falls on good soil takes time. It goes through an entire season of growth before it can reap rich rewards. So that process takes time. God needs that time with us for us to be developed into good soil. So we move on to the next parable, which is found in our Wednesday study in the book of Mark chapter 4, verses 21 to 23. He says, and he said to them, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on the stand? So this is Jesus trying to use the analogy of, you know, bringing up a question that would have a negative response followed by a question that would eventually have a positive response. He says, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? And the obvious answer is no, you do not do that. But don't you put it on its stand? Why? Because the purpose of a lamp, which is to emit light, would be defeated if it was put under a bed. Because the light is meant to shine, to bring about uh, uh, light to the world. And so for whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out in the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. The same interpretation that he had initially, he brings that at the end of this parable as well, the parable of the Lamb. Because the purpose of the light is to bring about, the purpose of the Lamb is to bring about light. And if they are not fulfilling, they lose that purpose. And so Jesus explains that there are many secrets that have to be brought into the public. And that is why we need to bring about his word into the rest of the people who are in darkness. Verses 24-25 again talks about considering carefully what you hear, he says, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from them. And this is from the memory text. 
because back in those days they used to have people who used to measure and give each thing in the exact proportion to the people the sellers used to sell these things in exact proportion and christ points out that there were some good sellers who would give a little extra to earn the goodwill of the people there so christ says that if you give a little extra he, anyone who gives a little more will be given more but who does not whatever he has will be taken away from him and christ is trying to reach them to the core of what they could understand he says that if you seek more or if you give more you would receive more the people who are content with what they already have and do not want to give anything more whatever they had in the first place would be taken away from them and he goes on in verse 26 he says this is what the kingdom of god is like a man scatters seed on the ground night and day when he sleeps or gets up the seed sprouts and grows though he does not know how and by itself the soil produces grain first the stalk then the head then the full kernel in the head and soon as the grain is ripe he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come and this is the next uh, part of the parable that is there which talks about how human beings have a purpose in taking the word of god to the rest of the world but the main work is being done by god and the holy spirit we have our part to play but god is the one who's carrying the work out when we sow the seed when we plant seed in the ground we do not know we a farmer does not understand the process of how the seed germinates how it grows into a full blown kernel we do not know the process the farmer sleeps and when he gets up he sees the sp seed sprout and grow he does not understand how it has happened but he believes and he knows it happens and the same way when we plant the seed the word into someone's heart we do not know how it works in their heart that work is done by god and the holy spirit they do that work our job is to plant the seed the seed in good soil in good ground and then god allows it to grow in our hearts we only end up seeing the works of the soil and the harvest and then we put the sickle to it because the harvest has come there is going to be a time when that is going to happen when the harvest is going to come and christ is going to assemble his people to be with him in his kingdom and god is doing that work human beings have a part but it's god who's carrying that work out on a day to day basis so we continue studying in verses 30 he says again he said what shall we say the kingdom of god is like or what parable shall we use to describe it it is like a mustard seed which is the smallest of all seeds on earth yet when planted it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade so this parable is talking about the mustard seeds now the mustard seeds might not be essentially the smallest seeds that exist but they are really really small they are very small and they have a diameter of 1 to 2 mm but yet they can end up growing as large as 10 feet god says that is how the kingdom of god is it's like a mustard seed it starts off really really small the commission of god started off really really small but it has grown in abundance it has grown all around the world the work of christ the work of his kingdom as it points out in the lesson the point you makes is that the kingdom of god which began very small will become large and impressive when we look at the image on the right it looks very impressive compared to the one on the left the small seeds the one on the right looks very impressive people in jesus day may have looked down on the dusty itinerant preacher from galilee with his band of disciples but time has shown that his kingdom of grace continues to expand through the world god's kingdom is expanding we have been called to be a part of it through these parables we realize how the kingdom of god is it starts off small but if the seed is planted in good soil it will grow it will grow over time and the seeds and the fruits of that growth will be visible to the world sister white writes true holiness is wholeness in the service of god this is the condition of true christian living christ asks for an unreserved consecration of undivided service how many of us are willing to give that 
undivided service. He demands the heart, the mind, the soul, the strength. Basically, all the facilities that would join in to carry Christ's word. Self is not to be cherished because the people who cherish self are like the soil or the weedy soil which grows thorns, which once they start cherishing themselves, the choice of this world would be choked by the thorns on which they are being laid. But he who lives to himself is not a Christian. We cannot be living for ourselves. Our service needs to be completely undivided for Christ. As we read this and we close with it, all these parables that Christ uses are the best method of communicating divine truth. Simple language using figures and illustrations drawn from the natural world, Christ opened a spiritual truth to his hearers and gave expression to precious principles that would have passed from their minds and left scarcely a trace that he not connected his words with stirring scenes of life, experience, or nature. In this way, he called forth their interest, aroused inquiry, and when he had fully secured their attention, he decidedly impressed upon them the testimony of truth. In this way, he was able to make sufficient impression upon the hearts so that afterward his hearers could look upon the things which he connected his lesson and recall the words of the divine teacher. Christ used these methods to talk to his people. He used all these methods to reach to them. But he did not give an interpretation immediately. He wanted them to come forward, come looking for the truth, seek the truth. And when you come looking for it, I am going to give that truth to you. I am going to open the doors of heaven, the doors of my kingdom, for you to understand what is it that I actually want from you. If the people walked away having their own interpretations of the parable, it would have not worked. So Christ gave them a gateway. You're standing at the gateway. Enter. Enter through the door. Come closer to me. If you come close to me, I am going to explain to you what those parables mean. What is the kingdom of God? And how should it be prepared? Let us prepare our hearts. The sower has sown a seed. The seed is the word. Each person has the word. The seed has been sown. Now it's up to the soil of how it responds to that seed. Let us all be like the good soil who allows the seed to grow in their hearts day by day. Let us prepare for the kingdom of God. Let us understand him on a daily basis because Christ wants to communicate with us on a daily basis. Let us not stunt the process of growth. I pray that we would continue to grow in Christ as we learn from these wonderful parables that Christ used back in those times that are so relevant even in today's world. And may we be able to grasp all the lessons that we have studied in our chapter this week. Shall we all close with a word of prayer? Creator God, many years back, thou sent thy son to help us understand the truths of thy kingdom. Thou have opened the avenues and thou have called us to study for ourselves. And when we seek and study for ourselves, we know that thou would open our hearts and our minds to the greater truths that are there hidden in thy word. Father, we pray that thou would continue to guide us, help us to grow, nurture us in good soil so that when we grow, the harvest would be productive grain. Pray that thou would be close to us. Keep us from the snares of sin. Guide us in our life. And more importantly, prepare us for thy second coming. For I ask these few words in thy holy and righteous dear name. Amen.